the liturgical year of Dom Prosper Gauranger. October 5th, Saint Placid and his companions, martyrs. The proto-martyr of the Benedictine order stands before us today in his strength and his beauty. The empire had fallen and the yoke of the Arian Goths lay heavy upon Italy. Rome was no longer in the hands of the glorious races which made her greatness. These, nevertheless, kept up their honorable traditions. They offered a great lesson for future times of revolution to other descendants of not less noble families. In lieu of the ensign of civic honor once committed to their fathers, the survivors of the old patrician ranks made it their duty to raise still higher the standard of true heroism, of those virtues which alone are everlasting. Thus, Benedict of Norcia, fleeing into the desert, had rendered greater service than any mighty conqueror to Rome and her immortal destinies. The world soon discovered this fact and then began, as St. Gregory tells us, the concourse of Roman nobles, bringing their children to the patriarch of monks to be educated by him for Almighty God. Placid was the eldest son of the patrician Tertullius. The excellent qualities early discovered in the child led his worthy father to offer to God without delay this dear first fruit of his paternity. In those days, parents loved their children not for this passing world, but for eternity, not for themselves, but for our Lord. The faith of Tertullius was well rewarded when, 20 years later, not only his firstborn, but also his two other sons and their sister were crowned with martyrdom. This was not the first Holocaust of the kind of that heroic family, if it be true that they were relatives by blood and heirs of the goods as well as the virtues of the holy Eustace, who had been emulated four centuries earlier with his wife and sons. Among the children of promise enlisted by the vanquished nobles of the ancient empire in the new militia of the Holy Valley, Equitus brought to Subiaco his son, Marus, a boy some years older than Placid. Henceforth, the names of Marus and Placid became inseparable from that of Benedict, and the patriarch acquired a new glory from his two sons, so united and yet so different. Equal in their love of their master and father, and themselves equally loved by him for their equal fidelity in good works, they experienced to the full that delight in virtue which makes its practice a second nature. However similar their zeal in using the most strong and bright armor of obedience in the service of Christ the King, it was wonderful to see the master accommodating himself to the age of his disciples, so adapting himself to their differences of character that there was nothing precipitate, nothing forced in his education. It disciplined nature without crushing it and followed the Holy Ghost without endeavoring to take the lead. In Marus was especially reproduced Benedict's austere gravity, and Placid, his simplicity and sweetness. Benedict took Marus to witness the chastisement inflicted on the wandering monk who could not stay at prayer, but Placid accompanied him to the mountaintop, where his prayer obtained a spring of water to develop from danger and fatigue the brethren dwelling on the rocks above the Anio. But when, walking along the riverside, holding Placid by the head and leaning upon Marus, the legislator of monks explained to them the code of perfection they were afterwards to propagate. The angels knew not which most to admire, the candor of the one winning the father's tenderness affection, or the precocious maturity of the other, meriting the holy patriarch's confidence and already sharing his burden. Who does not recollect the admirable scene of Marus walking on the water and saving Placid from drowning? Monastic traditions never weary of extolling the obedience of Marus, Benedict's humility, and the sagocious simplicity of the child pronouncing sentence as judge of the prodigy. Of such children the master could say from experience, the Lord oftentimes revealeth that which is best to him that is the younger. And we may well believe that the recollections of the Holy Valley prompted him later on to lay down in his rule this prescription. In all places whatsoever, let not age be taken into account as regardeth order. Neither let it be the prejudice of anyone, for Samuel and David, while yet children, were judges over the elders. The following lessons, taken from the monastic breviary, will complete the account of Placid's life and relate the manner of his death, 
1588, the discovery of the martyr's relics at Messina confirmed the truth of their acts. On this occasion, Pope Sixtus V extended the celebration of their feast under the rite of a simple to the universal church. Placid, a Roman by birth and son of Tartullus, belonged to the noble family of the Anici. Offered to God while still a child, he was entrusted to St. Benedict and made such progress in sanctity and in the monastic life as to become one of his principal disciples. He was present when the Holy Father obtained from God by prayer a fountain of water in the solitude of Subiaco. While still a boy, being sent one day to draw water, he fell into the lake, but was miraculously saved by the monk Marus, who, at the command of the Holy Father, ran dry shot over the water. Later on, he accompanied St. Benedict to Monte Cassino. At the age of 21, he was sent into Sicily to defend against certain covetous persons the goods and lands which his father had given to Monte Cassino. On the way, he performed so many great miracles that he arrived at Messina with a reputation for sanctity. He built a monastery on his paternal estate not far from the harbor and gathered together 30 monks, being thus the first to introduce the monastic life into the island. Nothing could be more placid or more humble than his behavior. While he surpassed everyone in prudence, gravity, kindness, and unruffled tranquility of mind, he often spent whole nights in the contemplation of heavenly things, only sitting down for a short time when overpowered by the necessity of sleep. He was most zealous in observing silence, and when it was necessary to speak, the subjects of his conversation were the contempt of the world and the imitation of Christ. His fasts were most severe, and he abstained all the year round from flesh and every kind of milk meat. In Lent, he took only bread and water on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. The rest of the week, he passed without any food. He never drank wine and always wore a hair shirt. So numerous and so remarkable were the miracles he worked that the sick came to him in crowds to be cured, not only from the neighborhood, but also Eutraria and Afria. But Placid, in his great humility, worked all his miracles in the name of St. Benedict, attributing them to his merits. His holy example and the wonders he wrought caused the Christian faith to spread rapidly. In the 5th century, after his arrival in Sicily, the Saracens made a sudden incursion and seized upon Placid and his 30 monks while they were singing the night office in the church. At the same time, were taken Eutychius and Victorinus, Placid's brothers, and his sister, the Virgin Fabia, who had all come from Rome to visit him, and also Donatus, Fanstus, and the deacon Fermatus. Donatus was beheaded on the spot. The rest were taken before Manucha, the chief of the pirates, and as they firmly refused to adore his idols, they were beaten with rods and cast, bound hand and foot, into prison without food. Every day they were beaten afresh, but God supported them. After many days, they were again led before the tyrant, and as they stood firm in the faith, they were again repeatedly beaten, then stripped of their clothes and hung, head downwards, over thick smoke to suffocate. They were left for dead, but the next day they were found alive and miraculously healed of their wounds. The tyrant then addressed himself to the virgin Flavia apart, but finding he could gain nothing by threats or promises, he ordered her to be stripped and hung by the feet from a high beam, insulting her meanwhile upon her nakedness. But the virgin answered, Man and woman have the same author and creator, God. Hence neither my sex nor this nakedness which I endure for love of him will be any disadvantage to me in his eyes, who, for my sake, chose not only to be stripped, but also to be nailed to a cross. Manucha, enraged at this reply, ordered her to be beaten and tortured with the smoke, and then handed her over to be dishonored. At the Virgin's prayer, God struck all who attempted to approach her with sudden stiffness and pain in all their limbs. The tyrant next attacked Placis, the Virgin's brother, who tried to convince him of the vanity of his idols. Manucha thereupon commanded his mouth and teeth to be broken with stones and his tongue to be cut out by the root. But the martyr spoke as clearly and easily as before. The barbarian grew more furious at this miracle and commanded that Placis 
with his sister and brethren, should be crushed under an enormous weight of anchors and millstones. But even this torture was powerless to hurt them. Finally, 36 of Placid's family, with their leader and several others, were beheaded on the shore near Messina and gained the palm of martyrdom on the 3rd of the Nons of October in the year of salvation 539. Gordian, a monk of that monastery who had escaped by flight, found all their bodies entire after several days and buried them with tears. Not long afterwards, the barbarians, in punishment of their crime, were swallowed up by the avenging waves of the sea. Dane, O Placid, my beloved son, why should I weep for thee? Thou art taken from me, only that thou mayest belong to all men. I will give thanks for this sacrifice of the fruit of my heart offered to Almighty God. Thus, on hearing of this day's triumph, spoke Benedict, thy spiritual father, mingling tears with his joy. He did not survive thee long, yet long enough to complete, of his own accord, the sacrifice of separations, by sending into far-off France the companion of thy childhood Marus, who was destined not to rejoin thee in heaven for so many long years. Charity seeketh not her own interests. She finds them by forgetting self and losing self in God. Placid had disappeared. Marus had been sent away. Benedict was about to die. Human prudence would have believed the holy patriarchs worked in danger of perishing, whereas at this critical moment it strengthened its roots and extended its branches over the whole world. Unless the grain of wheat falling into the ground die, itself remaineth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. As heretofore the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the Christians, it now produced a rich harvest of monks. Blessed be thou, O Placid, far beyond thy native Italy, and Sicily the scene of thy combat. Blessed be thou for the numberless ears of corn, for the abundant harvest sprung from the choice grain that fell to the earth on this day. Faith bids us see, in thy immolation, the secret of the success granted to the monastic mission of Marus. Thus, despite the great diversity and the unequal length of your paths in life, you are ever united in the heart of your master and father. At the appointed hour, he did not hesitate before the holocaust our Lord required of him. Wherefore, he now in heaven beholds the fulfillment of the hopes he had centered in his two beloved sons.